Something happens to you when you spend too much time learning something. You pick up bad habits and ways of thinking that might work well for what you're doing at the time, but just fall apart when you try to apply it to any other situation. For example, being a lawyer doesn't mean you're a sufficiently skilled orator to give a speech that lasts until the heat death of the universe. In fact, if you misapply the skills you've been taught to areas that are way outside of the places where they were meant to be applied, you're at risk of coming up with ridiculous solutions to problems, or it might make you so certain of the universality of your methodology that you keep on producing ridiculous takes while being a smug dickhead. There's a particular way I've described this in the past. I've called it STEM brain. I've even called my partner in videos when I'm thanking her for proofreading these scripts, STEM brained. I have the kindness of her heart, she reads these things and I drop this label on her. It's really unfair. So given it's something I say all the time, I've wanted to put something together that actually explains what STEM brain is and why it matters or why it doesn't matter. I don't know, it's just been one of those months for me and you all voted for this, so here you go, you get this. So that's what I'll be doing in this video, walking you through what a STEM brain is, and I'll be trying to define two distinct versions of it that I've seen, relating it to the way STEM is taught and perhaps more crucially perceived, then walk us through some examples of what happens when we allow the STEM brain to come into contact with politics and why it just falls apart once you start doing that. Like, any amount of contact between the two just seems to cause massive, massive problems. Hopefully, towards the end, I'll even put together a neat little guide for you all on how to potentially cure yourself of STEM brain. If you know about my background, which is that I did way, way, way too much physics at university, you might think it's a little bit odd that I'm doing this video on this topic, especially after arguably my most STEM-brained video that I could have ever come up with. Uh, but stick with me, and it'll all make sense, because my plan is to comprehensively bury my STEM brain once and for all. Whether or not it'll stay buried is a matter of debate, but let's see if we can manage to do that. STEM and its consequences. You probably know what STEM is, but to get it out of the way, it stands for Science, Technology, Engineering and Maths. Nerd shit, basically. Here's the thing though, when you think of STEM, especially the S part of it, you probably have quite a specific expectation of the kind of science that a STEM person does. Physics, definitely. Biology, sure, I guess. But sociology? Is that STEM? I'm not just relitigating the boring bullshit that first year students do about real science, which, if I was being honest, 18 year old me was exactly the kind of bore who did that. But that was because of STEM brain. To answer the question, Things like sociology, psychology, political science and economics aren't considered part of the STEM umbrella, even though one of them literally contains the word science. That's because social sciences are treated as separate from natural sciences like physics, chemistry, biology, like I said, the real nerd shit. Though that distinction is at least partially because their science isn't really repeatable in the same way as, say, a physics experiment where I bounce a ball from the same height over and over again. A real experiment I was made to do. That separation matters, though, of social sciences from natural sciences, or what we called hard sciences when I was this dipshit up here. I'm going to put a picture of 18-year-old me throughout this video. I'm going to find different ones and just embarrass myself in the edit. It matters because despite social sciences being science, they are science, right? They're kind of treated as if they're not. Partially, this is because STEM has become something that's supposed to confer status to the people that are in it. And I can justify that idea that it's supposed to confer status, right? Because think about how many different initiatives there are to get all sorts of different people into STEM. Too many. I mean, it's great if you're minded to do STEM and you get the encouragement you need, but honestly, how much of this is to do with encouraging people to learn something that they might enjoy, but are otherwise put off by a variety of factors, including sexism and racism and all of these other things, and how much of it is because there's a perception that STEM degrees are the ones that you get in order to then get the jobs that you're supposed to have so that you don't feel like a fucking failure all the time. 
It might have been a bit personal to me, that bit. I don't know. I studied the STEM field at university, and now I work in STEM for my day job, which, incidentally, if you'd like to help me quit, check out my Patreon. <laughs> I'm, prof I'm probably professionally required to say that that's a joke. That's a joke. No one take that too seriously. But I appreciate any and all patrons. Please, if you'd be so kind, you can end up joining my Discord and seeing how much shit I talk about all sorts of people. I talk shit all the time. Come and join us. One of the weird things about it is there's an assumption that I'm clever, right? I'm a fucking idiot, right? <laughs> there's an assumption that I'm clever. I mean, think about it. If I was clever, do you think I'd be doing this in this shirt? I mean, come on. What are we talking about? What are we actually talking about? Or wait a minute. Let me let me go. Let me go get something for you all. I mean, do you do you guys think that a clever person would have these? Would have these fucking monstrosities here? Come on. What are we talking about? I still need to find a way to get rid of these fucking things. But okay, th these things aren't mutually exclusive with being clever, though arguably the Golden Tonti badges might well be. But what was it about doing physics that led to so many people in my first year of uni saying, this guy, I'm gonna put the picture up here, please, maybe the one of me in a fez. I hope it's the one of me in a fez. Uh, was clever. Like, what was it about him? It definitely wasn't his striking good looks or the fact that he looked incredibly sober in that picture I just shared. Part of it is that STEM, despite all of the efforts to funnel as many people from as many different backgrounds as possible into it, tends to end up with a very narrow set of people taking up most of the space in it. This will be relevant in a little bit when I talk about the role of reason and how STEM encourages you to think, but the short version you need here is, it's white men, especially older white men, occupying most of the space. In fact, the inertia in STEM probably leads to a lot of older people who are really self-regarding, which creates some of the more egregious and frankly annoying cases of STEM brain. STEM, at least in my experience of it, tends to teach you a particular set of ways to approach problems, which in a scientific context is completely fine. This is not a video where I finally destroyed a scientific method once and for all, mostly because it's fine. For science, the way it usually works is like this. We make an observation, we do a bit of research around the observation, we make a hypothesis, we test it with an experiment, we look at the results, and then we make conclusions from it. Nothing controversial, that makes sense, right? That all completely makes sense. Now, there are also some additional things in play. The test should be repeatable so that other people can verify those results independently from you, which is why things like economics aren't natural sciences, because there isn't a Britain to where we didn't do austerity so we could check whether it was good or bad. I mean, it was bad. I don't need Britain 2 to work that one out. But it's why it's not a natural science. There's also the misconception that people have that I've encountered about STEM subjects, which is that there's one solution to any given question. It's easy. You don't have to do long essays where you have to sort of feel out all of the different possibilities and then form conclusions. You just know. The answers are there. You just know. Um, it's just, it can be the case, yes, there are definitely cases where there's one answer to a question. For example, if I asked you to add two numbers to make 14, most of you will probably come back to me and say 7 plus 7. And that's right, that's completely correct, you're right, don't worry, that is fine and right. But there's more than one way to add two numbers together to make 14, right? Um, sometimes there are multiple equally valid answers. It's just that some aren't applicable in the real world, some are just not the way that any sensible person would do it. Like, for example, if you were to add 5 and 9 to make 14, I'm not sure why those two numbers came into my head as an especially ridiculous pair, but just do 7 plus 7. And if any of you did say 5 plus 9 to that question, um, you should you should complain in the comments complain in the comments and justify yourself to me justify why that's what came into your head my god as we'll see a little later this is where the kind of thinking i described in part of my agrocentrism video the idea that that you can use the position where two lines meet to justify inhumane or bad policy comes from 
an over-prioritization of reason or of facts and logic, if you like. STEM sadly also has to contend with its origins and the idea that universities are some of the only institutions that haven't really changed since they were formed is, well, at least true enough that it's a factor here. The other thing that's true enough is that while the modern scientific method wasn't always necessarily the way things were done, it's rooted in older ideas. And those older ideas are themselves rooted in what I might suggest is fair to say are quite problematic concepts. Which might be why Logic Bros, one of the premium cases of STEM brain, just cannot get enough of it. One of the main things that's overemphasized, especially when we're dealing with things that aren't STEM, as STEM people, is reason. Reason for the purposes of this is just the idea that you can follow through issues in a logical progression and come to reasonable conclusions based on the information you have. Now reason is perfectly fine, right? You don't want to start forming judgments without some kind of structure to get you there, right? Here's the thing. Reason has been used and defined against specific groups throughout history. Whether it was the use of reason to justify the idea that men should be in charge of the household and therefore society as a whole, which, you know, goes back to Aristotle. Or the idea that colonized people lacked the capacity for reason, so it fell upon the noble white person to educate them in their wonderful peaceful ways, which as we know, was wonderful and peaceful. And you know, they got to do a little bit of imperialism in the process which helped enrich the imperial court. It's just a, it's just a nice side effect of this really horrible task I have to do. Oh, you know, nothing, nothing wrong with that. No. No. STEM, and really almost all science fields, but we're focusing on STEM, can't really be divorced from reason and can't be divorced from the institutions that teach it and the elitism they represent, or from the way that reason has been used to diminish and dismiss people from non-elite and minority backgrounds. All of this leads to explaining what the fuck STEM brain actually is, and what I see are two distinct types of it at play among people. There's the people like me, who had to suffer through STEM education, and now, employment, who can't help but enjoy a little bit, just a tiny bit of facts and logic, as a treat, and struggle to switch it off, even in contexts where it isn't appropriate. What can I say? It was just something I was taught to be good at, and... So were a lot of STEM brain sufferers. There's also the people who like to cling to the trappings of STEM for credibility or authority. These are your journalists who like to talk about hipster analysis, but we'll be getting onto that a bit later. For example, if you were in a social scientific field and begin to obsess over quantitative data and push towards interpreting the world using tools like statistics, which are important, don't get me wrong, but in social scientific contexts or in humanities fields, they can often leave some pretty serious gaps that lead to pretty bad or inadequate conclusions. In fact, let's look at this example of stem brain from Astronomy magazine. For most of recorded history, the answer was simple. The universe has always existed and always will. Few people challenged the dogma or even suspected it might not be true. I mean, it's such a perfect example of STEM brain that I almost want to end the video here. But I promise you hogs a video a month and I won't end it now. I mean, it's like they've never heard of creation myths and the apocalypse. Both concepts that have existed in belief systems throughout human history. Anyway, this isn't a video about apocalypses, though maybe it should be. Who knows? I think that'd be pretty fun at some point. We can see how these mindsets often end up causing problems when people decide to step outside of their fields. STEM brain becomes a serious problem when it starts to impact political discourse, and that's what we're about to look at. Let's go do that now. When STEM meets politics. We've established that a STEM education, or a deep aspiration to be seen as an authority in the way that STEM educated people are, can impact the way you approach problems, and that can extend to politics as well. Just as an example of the appearance of STEM being seen as an authority, take the way liberals in America reacted to that weird, fake, rogue NASA account, or whatever it was called. It's just a fucking tiring thing, man. I want to reiterate that if the problem you're trying to solve is something like, can I make an image? Can I take an image? Can I make an image of a black hole? 
approaching the problem in that way is good, even if the image might be, you know, a tiny bit underwhelming. Don't get me wrong, it's very cool. I just thought it might be more dramatic. You think black hole, you think like going back to the apocalypse as I was talking about, like a proper dramatic image of something. But you know, glowing donut is fun as well, I suppose. The problems can start when you try to apply this way of thinking outside of those specific fields. Let's take climate change. So I just did an incredibly science heavy video. Well, by the standards of what I usually do here on climate change. And for the most part, it was fine. All I did was state some simple facts. I didn't use many graphs. I mostly talked about the politics around climate change rather than the pure unadulterated facts of 30 minutes. Because if I got too into that, I could easily have fallen into the trap that quite a few people do, which is to say, well, it's all probability and I feel comfortable with a 33% chance of staying under 1.5 degrees warming. So let's say 2040 will be when we're carbon neutral, which you might think is fair. Things that have a 33% chance of happening happen all the time. But we're talking about large regions of the earth becoming uninhabitable rather than say you making your dexterity throw in D&D. Or let's look at the concept of universalism. A lot of people have decided that things like means testing are good because they direct benefits to the people who have the greatest need, right? You wouldn't be surprised to know that STEM people fucking love this shit because of course they do. It has the veneer of being evidence-based. You have to prove that you're in need, right? Other people have done a better dismantling of means testing than I ever could, but it couldn't really, but it really but really the issue is this, it doesn't save any money, it doesn't deliver support to all of the people who need it, and it's just generally a way of making people who need support seem unsympathetic, and they're usually the first stop for cuts anyway. Because I live in the UK, of course I have to bring it up, but Stembrain also entered the Brexit fray. The group Scientists for EU was formed, and while I completely understand scientists not wanting collaboration across borders to be harder, or for funding to be more difficult to get in, let's be honest, what are already quite underfunded fields, let's take a look at what the founder of this group had to say about the only person to be successfully no-platformed into irrelevance, Milo Yiannopoulos. Let's have a look at the tweets. I'm sorry, but... As a bloody lefty, this article is utter trash. Milo is allowed to walk around in public? FFS? To be blunt, what's the point in preaching tolerance, intellect and rights if a gay provocateur is banned from turning up at any public event? If you read this article, it's pure hate and censorship. Go watch some actual Milo videos. Much more interesting than this drivel. I don't agree with his political positions, but I enjoy his provocative nature. It's fun and challenging. I've never seen him be hateful. I disapprove of what you say, but I will defend to death your right to say it, is a famous quote attributed to Voltaire and others. Wise words, but who acts upon it? Well, here's a f clear case. The notion that Milo can't go to any public event is daft and deeply wrong. I know I'll get grief for this. I can already see people posting to me the horror stories. But challenge the arguments. Don't ban the man. Now, I know this is a searing combination of being a liberal and stem brain, but I've got to be honest. This is the result of stem brain primarily. Why? It's because the value of debate is tied to rationality in the minds of these people. There's this idea that in science, you're free to put forward your counter-argument to someone else's hypothesis, but someone suggesting a different imaging method to you isn't the same as, I think people from this group aren't human. People are always very quick to say, oh, well, why don't you let them embarrass themselves against your superior ideas? As if that's the point, really. In fact, one of the prime examples of people misunderstanding the effect of platforming fascists is the way that these exact people reacted to Nick Griffin shitting himself on Question Time, leading to the stem-brained and liberals laughing at him as he went on to lead his party to its best ever general election result. Brilliant. I loved growing up in this country, I really did. Just a fantastic time to grow up. 
One of the other ways it can be a problem is it manifests itself in pretty unsavory, possibly classist sneering. Take this exchange, for example. STEM is for losers, bro. Losers who enjoy money and job security. STEM definitely isn't for losers. Being a YouTuber is for losers. But also, I don't really think that doing STEM, or anything really, but that's a whole other thing, at university or professionally guarantees you job security. And if you live in the UK, strictly anecdotally, this is what I hear from friends, there are more people trained in a given field than there are permanent jobs. And you definitely don't get to enjoy money in this country, especially not on things like avocados, because otherwise the press will lose their fucking mind at you, because we have a very healthy and normal media ecosystem. This brings me on to a specific case of STEM brain, which you'll notice hits with a heavy dose of liberalism. You might be noticing a little bit of a pattern and correlation here. Brian Cox is a person who's kind of weird and hard to explain if you're not from the UK, so I'm going to do my best. He was in some god-awful band that wrote New Labour's anthem, Things Can Only Get Better, which I suppose is an improvement on the current Labour leader, Keith Starmer's The Worst Is Yet To Come. And then he becomes a cosmologist who gets to be famous because of a TV show. I'll tell a little anecdote. My first year of university was in 2012. So take the time to call me old or young in the comments, depending on how you view being 27 years old. You just get it out of the way. It was a larger group of students than usual, partially because I was part of the first cohort to have the 9k fees, which, you know, thanks Liberal Democrats, I really like that. This, you know, this is why everyone thinks that you're Tory scum to be honest. Um, and, you know, that allowed the uni to take as many people as they possibly could it could fit in the large lecture theatre and in the physics building. It was the large one. Everyone was using it all the time. And a lot more people applied for physics than usual, partially because of Brian Cox's TV shows. I'm not even kidding. Too many people I met in my first year cited him. So what does STEM brain have to do with him? Well, science teaches you to adhere to rigorous rules. If you break the rules, your work isn't valid. So for example, if I falsify results, I'm fucked. Except in the one case where the guy falsified his results and got an entire branch of genetics named after him. Which is, you know, it's not a great lesson to be teaching people, but what can you do? So let's see how in Brian Cox's case, the STEM brain manifested. This is the moment the government lost control of events. It is inconceivable to me that my government, a British government, would so blatantly devalue the concept of a rule-based international order. Churchill must be turning in his grave. MPs from across the house must act. Oh yeah, I'm sure that'll do the British government in. Yeah, definitely. That's definitely what's going to get them. Yep. Oh yeah, I'm sure that's what'll do the British government in. There's no way they'll be, rig be wriggling out of this jam. Ah, well, nevertheless. The reason why he has such bad politics isn't inherently because he's a STEM guy, right? I'm a STEM guy. I have relatively good politics. Some might say I was perfect. I wouldn't, but if you'd like to in the comments, you know, I won't stop you. It's because STEM and being a senior STEM person like him confers the status of intelligence. So people want to cluster around his position to get some of that secondhand authority that's just rubbing off on them from being near him. That was really awkward phrasing. I don't like that, but we're gonna roll with it. We're carrying on. It also helps that STEM is typically the preserve of white middle-class men. So to the lay person, they seem like natural authority figures. I wonder why that's the case. I couldn't possibly imagine what it is that makes that seem like the case to certain people. And it amplifies the effect. In fact, this is why we see so many of these people react so negatively to pushback, because they're insulated from it by status. But I explored some of that in another video. There's a take I really want to address in this section, which is aspirational STEM brain, just through and through. So let's take a look at this exchange between two very normal people. Presumably, so more people with humanities degrees can form expert opinions on epidemiology, more expert than, say, a group of senior professors of epidemiology. Yep, I really need some hipster analysis to reassure me. 
So I completely acknowledge that listening to experts in a pandemic, probably a good idea, but what was happening in the UK at the time was a deviation in policy from virtually every other country in Europe. And as it turns out, the UK had an awful pandemic response. A report by MPs described the early pandemic response as one of the worst public health failures ever, which in a country like the UK is pretty big, it's a pretty high bar to clear. So what drives people who are likely to be humanities graduates to behave like this? Well, it's because they wanted, one, to punch left, because of course they did, they loathed the leader of the opposition at the time, two, to attack humanities and implicitly place themselves closer to the experts, which in this case would be epidemiologists. Man, that is a difficult word to read off a script, let me tell you. And three, by placing themselves closer to the experts, they give themselves the veneer of authority. Which of course they don't deserve because their supine attitude towards the government probably could led to a lot of excess deaths. So yeah, thanks fearless British press, really doing your jobs. I mean arguably they're doing the job they're actually paid for, but again, another video. If you want to see where pure, weaponized stem brain can get you, I will simply point to Tom Chivers, who writes for Unheard, one of the most boring websites on the internet, but one of my proofreaders suggested I go take a look at it. Now, his output is fucking insane generally, mostly because he's vastly overestimating how knowledgeable he is, but I'll simply leave you with his magnum opus article. I'll put it here. Yeah. So that's where pure stem brain gets you. So with all that out of the way, all, I guess all that's left is for me to try and tell you how you can free yourself of this curse and perhaps even cure your stem brain if you happen to have one. How to cure your stem brain? Maybe? I don't think there's ever really a way to properly permanently cure stem brain. The instinct is there for life. It's just a matter of how much you choose to feed it. I won't lie, looking at my last video, it's obvious there's still a lot of stem brain rattling around in my head, and while I'd love for this video to be the end of my stem brain, I don't think it will be. Not least because the next video is about space, and I'm gonna get really into it with my big science brain. Nonetheless, I feel compelled to offer some steps for how you, or a friend who suffers from stem brain, might be able to at least get on the road to recovery, if not cure themselves completely of it. This is mostly going to be for fun, and for a little bit of my own self-reflection on how I think I've distanced myself from a lot of the things I've spoken about here. So relax, grab a drink, enjoy it, this is a much more casual section of the video. In fact, it's so casual I'm going to undo one of the buttons on my shirt. That's how casual it is. Stage 1 is feel ashamed of other STEM people. Throughout this video, I've shown you a lot of examples of just some of the worst instances of STEM brain imaginable. And unfortunately, some of them were from prominent people in the exact field that I studied at university. It's just embarrassing. So I resolved simply to never be like them, kind of like the lyrics to every single pop punk song from the 2000s, but if it was about not being a typical physicist. I'm a cool physicist. That's what I am. People like to say shame isn't constructive, but I disagree. Shame can help you realize that maybe the way you've been taught to think about problems and the world isn't quite right, because people you might otherwise respect keep coming up with clownish shit that you just can't justify or defend. Okay, in all seriousness, shame isn't actually constructive, so please don't take that too seriously, but the point stands. Stage two is actually doing a little bit of reading outside of science. Like, when we get to stage two of abandoning your stem brain, one of the things that helped me a lot was not having stray hairs in my face, first of all, but reading stuff that wasn't I fucking love science shite, and it turned out I liked it. I know, it's shocking. After so many years of just doing something because I was good at it, I found a bunch of stuff I actually enjoyed, and it you know, enhanced my understanding of the world. So once I started reading stuff from softer sciences or even the hated humanities as this charming guy, we'll put another picture of me at 18 or 19 up here, like, would have put it, he would have put it as, you know, the hated humanities. He's a real prick. Um, I feel like literally, I think I picked up a history book about 
I don't even know, might literally have been the Paris Commune, which would be very typical for me. And I could feel my brain healing. I wasn't just happier because I was actually reading about things I was interested in, but I was coming up with better opinions. Who knew? Who knew it was possible? Because I wasn't forcing things through the same lens over and over again, no matter how appropriate I might have thought it was. Stage three is acknowledge that you may never be cured of it, but you can use it for good. Look, I've been fighting against my instinct to overvalue statistics and try to offer solutions based on lines on graphs for a long fucking time. The truth is, if you've been taught a particular way to think about issues, and that way of thinking is considered the smart way to think about things, it's hard to let go. It's so hard to let go that some of my videos are guilty of it. But when these moments of needing to lean on statistics come, the fact that I know what the pitfalls might be means I can take action to stop it from fucking up any good politics that may be in there. So that's how you get videos like my last one on climate change, where I try to use the STEM brain for good. Stage four is try your hardest not to be a dipshit who forces the scientific method into every single thing. So with this final stage, I think about a particular incident that occurred in my final year of undergrad, and apologies to the friend, he watches these videos, so he's gonna feel very called out. We're having a barbecue in my friend's back garden, and his back garden overlooked the car park of the church. Now, I'm not proud of this. We were pretty hungover, and we were trying to ward off the worst effects of it with a few refreshments, you know, just, just, as, just what you do, just what you do. And it happens to be a Sunday. And my friend who's hosting us yells out to a poor couple on their way to the church, if you bother to read about science, you wouldn't be going to the church. Which leans into this idea of rationality becoming toxic and leading to pretty stupid behavior and political opinions that we can quite easily recognize in this case is pretty bad. Though, in fairness, I think my friend who hopefully is watching this video can at least partially blame it on the drinking that was going on on the day. But something he did and was doing there was assuming that adopting the rational processes behind STEM would lead to someone changing their faith and given the friend's wider political beliefs probably move them towards the correct politics in their mind, which he'll probably be mad at me for saying this, but at the time would have been a kind of technocratic liberalism, which, you know, we don't, we don't like here. We don't, we don't like the technocratic liberalism here. I said it earlier, this video isn't a rejection of reason. You want to have a framework which you can use to think about your ideas and your hypotheses. It's just that a ruthless application of the concept with all of the flaws and exclusions it brings with it doesn't lead to good politics or really a healthy way to interact with the world at large. People are more than numbers on spreadsheets. Life isn't Football Manager or D&D &D where you can use an understanding of data and probability to create optimal outcomes. You, know, you can tell I'm a lot of fun when I play tabletop games. In the end, it may not matter. You could find yourself like me, doing YouTube videos, jumping from stage to stage, trying desperately to improve the way you think about the world and issues within it. But I'll expand on that thought maybe a little bit in the conclusion. Concluding thoughts. Look, there's not much in the way of a conclusion to be had here beyond stop listening to people just because they have a PhD or have done subjects that you think are difficult or for smart people. You're just as capable, in fact, more capable of navigating politics than them because you know better than them who will improve or worsen your life. Sometimes believing your lying eyes is good, actually. So don't rely on anyone. Do a bit of reading yourself. And if you're a STEM person, please take a step back. Dabble in the humanities a little. Who knows? You might even like it. Otherwise, the real long-term solution to this is to radically change STEM subjects, the way they're taught, the kinds of people who teach it, and how we relate to them. That means more than just getting more women into STEM, which is good, but like other girl boss forms of feminism doesn't really deliver on the structural change needed to challenge things like patriarchy. So, if we mean to change STEM for the better, so that people don't constantly dunk on STEM people for being nerds and losers, let's think a bit bigger about what the consequences of STEM have been for our society and for our politics. Right, I want to thank everyone who lent their voice to this script. I mean, I don't know who they're gonna be yet because I haven't distributed the lines to the people, but you know what, I'm gonna put them, no, I'm gonna, you know what, we're gonna put them, we're gonna put them right here. We're gonna put them on this wall. Yep, yeah, these are all of the people who helped me
by lending their voice for this video. You can find links to all of their cool stuff in the description below. You can also find links to my very cool proofreaders, uh, Mick Wright, who just always has to suffer through these scripts. He, I've mentioned him every single video as a proofreader. Sanguinian, who also is an Ale member, and so go check out his really cool stuff. I'll leave a link down below to his stuff. And uh, my partner, she doesn't have anything. She doesn't. She doesn't do things. She's not. She's not a person who does things online. So, you know, that's just her choice. Um, and finally, to my patrons, thank you so much. Uh, we're gonna put them on this wall as well. But you get to go on the wall. You see. And a special shout out to Drone Riff, Mercutio, and Sarah. Thank you very much for your support. If you would like to support me as well. It's patreon.com slash skvacrusader. Just as little as a quid. Just a quid. You know, a quid a month. It's nice. It's a nice gesture. And you get to see all of the supremely cursed shit I find before anyone else. And maybe if you pay enough, you get to come to Discord and chat shit with me. Come on, who wouldn't love that? But, you know, on that note, on that cheery note, everyone, take it easy, have a good day. And I'll catch you on the next video, which is on space. So, you know... So much for ending the stem brain.